We read before the prayer here in John 17, there are a couple of verses I want to highlight as we wrap up, Lord will, in this series, I am that I am. And first of all, I just want to deal with something that Jesus says here in verse 3. Here in John 17, the father is, is receiving the, the, this prayer of his son. It is the prayer that Jesus prayed, and it's an open-ended prayer. It's a prayer that affects every single one of us. According to verse number 20 of that same chapter, it's a prayer he prayed for us. But in this prayer, he says, or he defines rather what eternal life is when he says in verse 3, and this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Th just th let's just take just a second and just think within yourself, not out loud, but, but just think within yourself. How would you define eternal life? How do you view eternal life? How do you see eternal life? And I, and I think there are a lot of people that have asked that question. They would say heaven. But that would be like, you know, if I ask, you know, or if you ask Chrissy and you said, what is marriage you know, and she said a house. Well, if I was standing next to her, I might, that might bother me. Like, hey, whoa, hold on a minute, baby. You just said marriage is a house. Do you remember the house that we were, you know, we moved into when we first got married? It was my rent house. It wasn't even my house. And so, you know, surely you didn't marry me for a house. And, and but yet many believers see eternal life as heaven. Heaven is not eternal life. Heaven is just a place. Eternal life is to know God, to have a relationship with God, to have a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus here in John 17, 3 is defining what eternal life is, and it is to know God. It is to know his son, Jesus Christ. Last week, we spent the whole service dealing with nine or ten uh, statements that Jesus made referring to himself as the I am God. And here Jesus at the end of his ministry and before he gives his life for hours on the cross, he prays to the Father and speaks of eternal life that we have the offer of through Christ. And he says, this is life eternal. And I just want to hone in on this for a minute. To know God, to know the Father, to know Jesus is eternal life. He goes on to verse 6 and he says, I have manifested thy name. I have manifested thy name. What does that mean, I have manifested thy name? Well, the first name that we get in Scripture that was self-given by God is this name, I am. It shows up in Exodus chapter number 3. Let me talk just a little bit more about the name, and then I want to get into some things. This name that God gave himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, when you study it in its context... God appears to Moses, and he says these things, and I want to I reflect on them real quick. He says, I have seen the affliction of my people. I have heard their cry. I know their sorrow, and I am come down to deliver them. So the things that he revealed to Moses in Exodus 3 is, and I'm going to repeat them again. He says, I have seen the affliction of my people. I have heard their cry and I know their sorrow. So he both sees me, hears me, and knows me. Come on, somebody. Let me say that again. He both sees me, hears me, and knows me. And what he tells Moses is, I am come down because of what I have seen, heard, and what I know. And so, so I've come to deliver them, he, said, he tells Moses. And Moses says back to God, okay, if I'm to go tell the people that you've seen them, that you know them, that you've heard them, and you've come down to deliver them, they're going to want to know who you are and what name do I give them. And that's where he gives this name. He says, you tell them that I am has sent you to them. I am. Now, that, that, it, it doesn't get more personal than that name, I am. When you look at the I, I, personal I that's a personal thing, I. When you begin a statement with I, that's personal, am speaks of present. Now, though God is eternal, and we're going to look at this in Psalms 90, and he exists from everlasting to everlasting, even though he is an eternal God, in our situation, he's always present. But his presence and his presentness in our life comes with past, present, and future all at the same time. That'll make sense here in just a few minutes. So he is a God that is personal. He is a God that is present. 
As we talked about early in the series, when he says to Moses, I am has sent you, tell them I am. It would not matter what the individual in, uh, in Egypt were going through. Whatever their need was, he was saying, I am. We read in Psalm 105, Psalm 105 tells us what the children of Israel's condition was in Egypt. And they were feeble, and they were sick, and they were oppressed, and they were weak, and they were poor, and they were in bondage. And you might have some of all of that in your life. For an example, have you ever been sick and broke? All right. Have you ever just been sick of being broke? Or have you ever been so sick it didn't matter that you were broke? Take my house. I'm so sick, just take me to the hospital. I remember being so sick one night, I I, I just figured I needed to die. I woke up and told my wife, I am about to die. And I welcomed the thought. Because if it would have gotten me out of that sickness, then take me, Jesus, take me now. I'm too sick to wait on the rapture. I'm ready. Now, healthy, you know, living, I don't want to die. I want to live to see my children's 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 children. But you can get so sick that you don't even care if you see your child right now. It's just like, get me out of here. Some of y'all never been that sick. So, you know, the, the point I'm making is, is that when God sent the, the, you know, Moses to the children of Israel, they, they, they were all going through something, but it's all really relative. And and, and what he's saying to the one that is sick, I am your healer, but for that one right next to you that's feeling healthy but tired of being broke, I am your provision. But to the one that really doesn't, you know, care about health or prosperity, they're just mentally, you know, broken and just need peace that goes beyond their understanding. He's saying, I am that too, that no matter what your individual position is, I am that you need, I am that. That's what God is saying. And what we're going to see here in just a few minutes is that when, 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 you know, God will bring a word that's a corporate word, but he's such a personal God that he brings an individual word. In other words, God's not just looking at this assembly today and saying, okay, I know what you as an assembly needs. He will look at us each individually and say, okay, I know what you in that assembly need. He's a personal God. Now, I want to come back to the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. I want to go to the 52nd chapter. So if you would turn there with me, Isaiah chapter number 52. Now, we live in a culture where we're seeing an escalation, a climax of something that's been the enemy's agenda since the beginning. We live in a culture right now that is obsessed with individuality and that there is no truth. Truth is what is real to you and that nothing outside of us can define us, only what's inside of us. We live in a society today where people are, de- are afraid to even define what is good and evil. And you might go and ask some people some questions, even about something as horrific as murder. And they would say, well, you can't call them all murder wrong. It's based on the murderer and what was going on with him at the time. Murder could have been right. We live in this society where, where it's not about laws, not about rule, not about good, not about evil. It's all about self and what do you feel and what do you sense and when you look inwardly what do you see because that's your truth that's your reality you can be anything you see and so we I I sense in this culture this obsession with us looking inward for solutions looking in our heart oh I need to get away for three days why well I got to do some soul searching okay whose soul are you searching mine okay Uh, how are you going to search your soul well I'm going to relive my past I'm going to think about my upbringing I'm going to think about you know on my first marriage. I'm going to think about my education. I'm going to think about all that I've been through. Well, what are you after? Well, I'm just, I need to find me. Okay, you need to find you. Do you remember everything about your life? Well, I, I'm going to research that for the next three days. So many times we think the answer 
to life lies within us. And what I want to show you today is that you can't stand before an I am God and say I am. When you stand before an I am God, the only appropriate response is he is, not I am. He is. What I want to do today is show you Colossians chapter 3 verse 3, that my true life is hid in Christ. My true life is hid in God. I've done with trying to figure out me. I need to see me through the eyes of him. Who have you made me to be? And what am I when I am in you? Remember, remember, Jesus said, Jesus said in John 17, 3, that eternal life is to know God, to know Jesus. But what was Satan's first lie or what was the context of Satan's first lie to man in the garden? Because his method has not changed. His agenda has not changed. His lie has not changed. And what, what Satan said to Eve in that garden about the, 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 the tree that God had reserved to himself, the tree of knowledge. It's a, yes, it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but we can shorten that up and say it's actually a tree of knowledge. And, 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 and that knowledge was uh, uh, tempting to man. It was appealing to man to know something outside of himself. And what Satan said or what the serpent said to Eve was, eat of this tree and you will be as God. You will know good and evil. Why have a God outside of you to tell you what is good and what is evil? You decide what is good and what is evil. Why have a God outside of you to define you? You be as God. You write your story. You find yourself. You be the real you. You don't need God. That was the first message of Satan, and that message is as real today as it was when, it, when, when, when Eve partook of that fruit in Genesis chapter three. Can you say amen? amen? So much so that when people see something within their heart that might need to come out, we don't need to act on everything we think. Just because you thought it don't mean you, you needed to have thunk it. Bad English, but good preaching. I don't need to act on everything that I think, think, and I don't need to become the product of everything I think. Because one of the reasons that God had to judge the earth you know, in the days of Noah in the first place was that man's thought was only evil and that the imagination of his heart was only evil all the time. And God said, nothing's going to stop what he's imagined to do. I've got to address this. So uh, an imagination that doesn't have any you know, restraint is dangerous. Because you'll try with everything in yourself to become what you see. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. But everything that I think is not accurate. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says, I'm to take my thoughts that rise up against the knowledge of God the, the thoughts that rise up against the knowledge of God. I'm supposed to cast those thoughts down. And if you were here Thursday night for Olive Tav, you found out that, that even though God saved Jacob and changed his name to Israel, even as Israel, he was still dealing with Jacob. Jacob meant deceiver. Israel meant prince or power of God. The power of God was still dealing with the old Jacob. And if you wonder how long that battle goes on, we talked about it Thursday night at Olive Tav. Genesis 42, we see Jacob in his deathbed. And they came to Jacob in his deathbed and they said, Jacob, your boy is here to see you. And the Bible says that Israel in his strength rose up. Wait a minute, what, were there two men in the bed? No, it was, it was Jacob who is Israel or Israel who is Jacob. It was one man in the bed, but it was his old nature and his new nature all in one. They came in and said, Jacob, your boy's here to see you. And Israel in his strength rose up. The point that I made or hoped to try to make Thursday night was that all the way to our death, we're contending with our flesh, who, who, we, were, who, who we are naturally and who God has called us to be spiritually. And there's this war that's going on and it's nonstop. But if we're going to live life to its fullest, if we're going to find abundant life. We got to live out that one that God has called me to be, not that one that we see ourselves naturally to be, because one will always be limited and will not bring God glory. 
When Colossians 3, 3 says, my life is hid in Christ in God, that's the life I want to pursue. Who have you made me to be? Who, who did you purpose me to be? Now watch this in whatever chapter I, t- I told you. Where, where did I tell you how to go? Isaiah 52. All right, w- 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 watch this in, in verse uh, uh, number three. For thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourselves for nothing. And you shall be redeemed without money. Thank you, Lord. For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there. And the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now, therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for nothing. They that rule over them, make them to howl, saith the Lord, and my name continually every day is blasphemed. I didn't really get into this in this series, but there's just a little point right here, a little window where I can inject a couple of thoughts. When, you know, when we think about the name of the Lord being blasphemed, that, that not only involves his name, but it involves his identity or who he is. In other words, I can live a life where my life is blasphemous to the name of my Savior, where my life's not reflective of his name. Thou leadest me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The, the, even here, the children of Israel, not even knowing his name, could blaspheme his name by living beneath the authority and salvation that's invested in his name, what you say. Verse six, therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore shall they know in that day that I am he that does speak. Behold, it is I. Now, notice what he's saying here. We got to really get this. God said, I want my people to know my name. I want them to know when I speak that it is I, that I am he that speaks to you. See, that's personal. That's personal. That, 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 that's not a group thing. That's not your Bible studies revelation. That's not your church's word. That's an individual relationship that God is calling you to have. The Lord doesn't want to just have a relationship with us as a corporate assembly. He wants to have a relationship with each one of you individually day by day. So he's saying here, uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to you. You're going to know my name. And when I talk to you, you're going to know it is I. That's personal. Now, let me show you a picture of this in the New Testament. So if you would, come over to the Gospel of John, and I want to go to the fourth chapter, John chapter number four. Remember, Jesus said in John 17, three, that eternal life is to know God and to know Jesus whom he had sent. To know him, to have a relationship with him. Because he's a relatable God, he's a personal God. To find out who I am in him. To live a life that brings him glory because the source of that life was him. According to Acts 17, in him I live and move and have my very being. See, sometimes you see a response in a person and you don't know why that response is there. You know, you, 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 you see what you see, but you don't know what led to what you see. To give you an example, this past Thursday on the way to the Thursday night, uh, second night of Olive Tov, I had had a war in my mind all that day. I I couldn't rest. I tried to rest myself for the second. I could not rest. It's like my nerves didn't have any skin on them. Everything was just touching and bothering me. Don't act like you ain't ever had a day like that. Everything was touching my nerves. And I, I felt like I, I, was, I, I was having a hard time to process and, and to focus. Lord, what do you want to say tonight? What do you want to do tonight? And even on the way, I'm just confessing my own weakness. It's over now. But, but on the way to the conference Thursday night, this is, this is me. This is me Thursday. It's being real with y'all. I was processing in my mind on the way to the conference Thursday night that this might be the last I'll have time for me. Maybe this is it. Maybe, maybe I, I, have, I have taken this as far as I can. Somebody else is going to pick it up. And like, this is it. This is how bad off my mind was. You understand the words I'm speaking to you. 
Because y'all might think I just walk up in here and got it all together all the time. No, I deal with this. I'm Israel dealing with Jacob all the time. You see me in worship, you, you, you might not understand what I'm doing. What, am I, what I'm doing on that front and I'm begging God. I am pleading God. Feel me, use me, empower me. I, I, you know, if you see an expression in me, it's because I know it. when I get up here, I can't be Jacob. When I get up here, I want to be Israel, but I know I don't have it in myself to do what he called me to do. I need all of him and none of me. I'm like a glove laying on a table. That glove can't do nothing until you put a hand in it. I want him to be the hand in my glove. What you say, my God. Woo! So Thursday was a powerful, powerful night. And at the end of the message, we gave an invitation and the Lord just led me to do the invitation a certain way. And in every single section in this worship center, there were people that stood up to receive Christ. If you were there, you know what I'm talking about. Now, I'm looking at what God had done, but I'm knowing the status of me, the state of me. I knew the state of me going in, and then I saw what God did, so I knew it was him. That's what had me running crazy up here Thursday night is because I knew what God had done. You might have looked at my praise, and when I got up and ran around, you might have said, what's wrong with him? You don't know what I was dealing with. See, my point is, my point is, when you hear somebody's praise, not just in a worship service, but where you cannot give a man credit for something. You know, standing by the, the Keurig at the job, and that person not roll that credit back over on the Lord. You know, this whole idea of a, of a self-made man is a lie. Did you tell your lungs to breathe? Did you tell your heart to beat? Did you tell your mind to wake you up today? Listen, it is in him I live. It is in him I move. It is in him that I have my very being. And so much of my existence don't even have nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with him. I wouldn't have had the strength to done that job and brought home that paycheck had God not given me that. I wouldn't have had the wisdom to put all that together and made that work for my good had he not given me that wisdom. There is so much that is beyond us that he should get the glory for that to live under the mindset that you are a self-made man and that your success comes from going off to the woods somewhere and soul searching. So I just need to find me. I just need to find me. I just need to find me. No, you don't need to find you. You need to find him because the life he has for you is in him. So watch this in, watch this in, in, uh, in John 4. This is going to make so much sense here in a minute. Watch this. John 4, if you're there, say amen. Here's a woman at a well in the heat of the day. Because I believe she don't want to deal with nobody. Yeah, have you ever went to Walmart at four in the morning because you thought you could avoid a crowd? <laughs> She's going to the well at the sixth hour so she won't have to deal with no folk because she got too much in her life right now to be dealing with people. That's a scenario. Do I know that to be true? I don't know, but I'm going to show you why I'm drawing these conclusions. She might have been at the well hoping to run into a man. Now, Pastor, why would you say that? Well, because we're going to find out she doesn't have five husbands and she's living with a man she's not married to. So she obviously got men issues. <laughs> I ain't trying to judge this woman. I'm trying to, all of us are this woman if we'll watch. So whatever's got her there, she's there. And then Jesus, lo and behold, no, lo and behold, in verse 7, said, give me something to drink. And she looked back at this man in verse 9, and she said, wait a minute. How is it that you being a Jew going to ask me, which is a Samaritan woman, for a drink? That means she already has some offense 
A lot of folk that get offended at you are already offended. They just want to prove why they're offended. Y'all don't hear me. I had a woman go off on me at Shane's, go off on me on a Saturday. She came out behind the register checking out just so she could go off on me for not preaching funerals. She wasn't a member of the church. The crazy thing is I was in a suit and had just left a funeral. She, was wait, she had been waiting on this moment to meet James McManus to say, I dare you, don't do funerals. She just went on me. Everybody was looking. I was like, oh, my God, I just left a funeral. Do I leave a funeral every Saturday? No, but it just so happened this Saturday, I just done a funeral. She picked the wrong Saturday, messed me about funerals. But I didn't offend her the moment I walked in the building because I'd never met the woman. I never had a conference. She already had the offense. She, she was away. So I had to be careful of my demeanor and my response because she was already offended before she got to me. This woman was already offended at Jesus before he even got there. He didn't ask her nothing about Jewish Samaritan backstory. He said, water. There's a well. She got a bucket. Just say no. You have to be ready because people that approach you sometimes are already offended and they're looking to validate it. Mm -hmm. So he said she had to go through this whole long story about why Jews shouldn't be talking to Samaritans and Jews don't talk to Samaritans. But yet you're a Jew and you're talking to me. Well, he, he said, so he said back in verse 10, he said, woman, look here. If you knew who it was that was talking to you, you'd be asking me for the water. Oh, I really said, oh, I'm going to ask you for it. You ain't even got a bucket. <laughs> so Jesus dealing with this woman about a water that he would give her. He said, I tell you what, go get your husband. Verse 16. The woman said, well, actually, I don't have a husband. Jesus said unto her, you well said you have no husband. Verse 18, you've had five husbands, and, and the one you have now is not your husband. Now, now, now let's just follow this for a minute, please. This is the last service, all right? We're going to get this one. Jesus is letting her know I know you. You want this to be about Jews and Samaritans. You want this to be about water. I'm actually here for something bigger than what you're making it. I know you, woman at the well. I know how many husbands you've had. I know why all five of their marriages failed. I know what led you to believe you needed a man to make you whole. I know what made you leave your first husband or him leave you. He's saying, I know, let me just be, let me just make up something. I know why you got the scar on your left knee. Jesus is saying to the woman here, I am a personal God. I know you. I know your backstory. You're making it about this present moment, but when I deal with you in your present moment, I bring all of your past because I know all of you, but not do I just bring your past. I know your destiny at the same time, so you're trying to put me in the box of now, but I know your past now, and if you help me, I hear what I'm saying to you. Ah! I'm too tired for y'all not to get this. We, 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 we come to God and we think he's just dealing with today. If you ever sat up under good counsel, a good counselor would try to pull stuff in your past that's making you the way you are. Oh. I don't want to talk about what my, what my childhood got to do with anything. I don't, don't want to talk about it. Because your childhood has formed you into this mindset. A good counselor would dig way deep and say, hey, let's find the root of why you are the way you are now. So what God is doing through Christ here with this woman at this well is he's saying, I know you're trying to make it about right now, about a Jew and a Samaritan and about a water and a well and a bucket. But I'm going to go ahead and let you know this moment is bigger than right now. So go bring your husband. Don't have one. That's right. You've had one, two, three, four, five. And the one you're with right now is not. That's six. See, the I am God always shows up in our presence, but he's from everlasting to everlasting. So when he, when he deals with us in that present, in our present, he's bringing past, present, and future all in the same conversation. 
That's why I need him so desperately in my life because I can't go search my soul and really find me because all I know is my experience and what I'm dealing with today. What I don't know is my future. Or who he made me to be. So watch this, verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. Christ is coming, Christ is coming, the Messiah is coming, Jesus Christ, Yahshua, that's the tra- tra- Jesus is a transliterated name of Yahshua, Yahweh Shua, Yahweh I am, Yahweh God, Shua salvation. Yahshua, Jesus means I am salvation. That's who Jesus is, salvation. He's Yahweh saves. His last name is not Christ. Christ is his title. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the sent one. He's the son of God that came into the earth to save us from our sins. He's who the I am God would become. When the word was made flesh, John 1, 14. So she's saying to him, well, when Messiah comes, watch verse 25. When Messiah comes, when he has come, watch this. He will tell us all things. So earlier in verse 19, the woman said, I perceive you are a prophet. Like, well, 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 how this man know I done had five husbands? Whoa, 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 what, you a preacher? Are you a prophet? What is this? She said, you, you, your knowledge, oh, this is so good. She said, mm, your knowledge reminds me of something I heard. There's a Messiah coming, a Christ, a Savior who's coming, and he's going to know everything. Oh, that, that, this reminds me of him. And then Jesus looked back at her in verse 26 and said, I that speak unto thee am he. In other words, I am that. That Messiah you're talking about, that's who I am. That's how I know about your backstory. That's how I know about your husbands. That's how I know about your current living condition. It's I am the one that knows all things. That's who she just met at this well. What you say? And he's about to reveal to her Something about her that she don't know about herself. Glory to God. See, being that God is eternal, and I'm going to give you this verse to back up what I'm getting ready to say. Psalms 90 verses 1, 2, and then verse 4 says this. You can put it in your notes. Psalms 90 verses 1 through 2 and then verse 4 says this. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. From everlasting to everlasting. That's like saying eternity past to eternity future it's, it's almost an oxymoron, but it's the only way we can begin to understand how big and timeless God is. You are God. Verse 4 says this of Psalms 90. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it's past, and as a watch in the night. So yesterday that is past, you know, if you look back on yesterday, whether that was 12 hours or you had the whole 24-hour thought of yesterday, you only pull out a few things that you did. Hey, what did y'all do yesterday? Oh, man, we went out to eat yesterday evening. That took you 24 hours? We don't take a lot from yesterday. We can sum it up in a couple in a minute. He, he's saying that, that God's thought of us And his position toward us and the way he views time is like our thought of yesterday or a watch in the night. He he says this in verse 4. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past. Think of how fast a day goes by or a watch in the night. He's saying that's how fast a thousand years goes before God. In other words, what you could summarize in one moment, God can do that with one thousand years. That means when, when he sees me, he's seeing everything all at the same time. How could I not rely on a God that has that vantage point? 
How, how, how could I be fi a firefighter in the wilderness fighting a fire and men went up the fire tower and they could see from whence way the fire was coming and I don't have a radio or, or, or walkie talkie or I'm not asking the guy to come down off that tower. Tell me what you saw from up there so I don't go the wrong way. We've got a God who sets in eternity. He sets high, but he looks low. He knows everything in one moment, your past, your present, your future. Who are we not to rely on that kind of God? Who are we not to call on that kind of God? And you're talking about, well, I gotta go search myself. Search yourself. Well, y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? You only know who you are right now. You only know what your experiences have led you to be. God knows what his plan for you is. I'm gonna give you two examples real quick before we go any further. I won't go another further until we get these two examples so this thing can resonate in us. Number one, think about Jeremiah in chapter one. Jeremiah in chapter one, God says, hey, I put my word in your mouth and I, I, and I put my fire in your bones and you're gonna prophesy. And Jeremiah looked back and God said, hey, I'm but a child. I'm but a child, I'm but a child. He's like, you don't know how old I am, God. I'm but a child. I ain't old enough to do this. So God looked back at Jeremiah who was saying, I'm but a child. I'm but a child. I'm but a child. God looked back and said, before, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you and ordained you. I knew you before you knew you. You going to come to me and tell me how old you are? I knew you before you had a birthday. I'll give you another example. In Judges 6, there's this man by the name of Gideon. Now, most of us that have studied the Bible or have heard the Bible preached at length, when we hear of Gideon, at least I would, I'm thinking about Gideon and his big old army. Remember when Gideon, Gideon went out to fight that big old army? Anybody know the story? What was the problem with his army? If you know what I'm talking about, I tell you. It was too big. That's what, I, that's what I knew if you'd ask me just casually, hey, tell me about Gideon. I said, well, he went out to fight with a big old army and God said, your army's too big. Narrow it down. But most of us don't know the backstory that might have led to Gideon wanting a big army. See, the woman, I'm gonna put a pin in Gideon. We'll come back to Gideon in a second. The woman here in John 4 is running from folk. She don't even want this man, Jesus, talking to her. She might have men issues. If you had five husbands, you don't like the one you're with, you might have a male issue. And Jesus at that well by himself, give me the drink. <laughs> no, no, that's what my third husband asked me. <laughs> Are y'all with me? So she said, what are you doing, Mr. Samar Mr. Jew talking to me a Samaritan? You better leave me alone. Dude, I ain't got time for no man right now. I came here at the sixth hour. Get, get away from me. Or she might have been there to meet one. I don't know. The point is, is that Jesus took this woman as showing up at the well alone for whatever reason she's there alone. And when he gets through ministering to her, the woman that wanted to be alone and wouldn't talk to nobody goes back to Samaria and preaches Jesus to the whole city and the whole city came out to hear Jesus at the well. In other words, the woman that didn't want to talk to one person ended up reaching the whole city. That was the her before Jesus and the her after Jesus. She didn't know who she was until she met him. She found herself in him. So watch this, back to Gideon. Gideon, the Lord shows up to Gideon in, in Judges chapter six. And Gideon is uh, at th uh, threshing the wheat. He's separating the wheat from the chaff, which you would normally do out in the open where the wind's blowing, so the wind would blow the chaff away and the wheat, which is heavy, would fall back down on the threshing floor. That's what you would normally do. But Gideon and the children of God had enemies. So Gideon took his wheat to the wine press, and he's using a wine press to separate the wheat from the chaff in secret. So he down in the wine press, 
breaking out the wheat and looking around and make sure nobody's seeing it. Afraid. A scared farmer. And God shows up to Gideon in Judges chapter 6. You can read this for yourself, starting in verse 11, 10 or 11, right in there. And he says this, he says, Hello there, mighty man of valor. Now, how are you going to call a scared farmer separating the wheat from the chaff in a, in a wine press, hiding out, man, mighty man of valor? That's a scared farmer. That's what that was. And so just in case, you know, the Lord didn't understand, Gideon wanted to enlighten the Lord of who he was. So Gideon says back, and you can read this for yourself in Judges 6, starting in verse 11, Gideon says back to God, he says, hey, wait a minute, I'm actually a farmer. I am poor. My, 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 the, the people that I, I'm from are the smallest in number. And I'm hit out over here trying to separate this wheat from the chaff. So he's like, you got the wrong dude by saying I'm a mighty man of valor because I ain't nothing strong about me. I'm poor, I'm scared, and I come from a very small number. That's what Gideon saw in himself. But God saw something else in Gideon. That's why I don't want to go find me without him. Mm -mm, I don't like the version of me. I, I don't like the version of me without him. So now I want to show you something, and I'm going to finish the story, but you've got to see this. So go back with me to the book of Isaiah again. And I want to go to the 47th chapter. Isaiah 47. Because I want to pull back in this lie of the enemy that, that we are our own God. Now, watch Gideon's backstory. Gideon says to God, I'm poor, I'm a farmer, I'm scared, and I come from a very small group. We don't have a lot of folk. I never had many friends. Nobody loves me. I don't have anybody that's for me. We can all relate to some of that, right? Some of us can. So it would make sense that that Gideon would say, okay, Lord, I see you've called me to be your battle leader. But if I'm going to be the one fighting battles for you, you better give me 10,000 soldiers. Because I know what it's like having a few in number. See, he was bringing his past into his present. And so why would God stop a man from carrying more to the battle? Because he's got to break Gideon's stronghold that thinks his only way to success is through a large people and that the reason he was poor and a farmer is because he didn't have nobody. God's got to show him, you don't need nobody but me. You don't need no one but me. I know who I made you to be. And when I get through doing this, you're not going to be able to point to anything else other than me on why you got the victory. See, th th this would be like Israel bringing in Jacob. Gideon was bringing in the farmer and not allowing himself to be the warrior. The moment you start living after soul searching, the moment you start living after, uh, well, Lord, I, I know I hadn't been in prayer, but I've been so busy. And pastor, I know I hadn't been in church, but I've been going through some stuff. Think of all the times that we excuse self for why we weren't before God. Because we had to get this worked out. We had to add some hours. We had to get in more time. We had to get this taken care of. We had to be our own God. And when we got through being our own God, and once we became the God of our life, we'll go back and see God. That makes absolutely no sense. What, the, the, the mindset of that is is that you don't need anything outside of yourself. And that's what Satan was telling Eve from the beginning. You don't need a God. Be your own. 
So watch this in, in, in Isaiah 47. If you're there, say amen. amen. Verse number 10. For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Thou hast said, here we go. None seeth me. Because you know we'll do some stuff if we think ain't nobody watching. Be real. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. What? See, James 3 says there's a wisdom that comes from beneath from this earth and there's a wisdom that comes from on high. And when I start trusting in my own wisdom, when I start trusting in my own knowledge, I'm in a dangerous place because I'm saying I don't need anything outside of me. Sometimes, you know, in our foolishness, we get in a mess and then we literally pray to God and say, Lord, now I got myself in this one and I'll get myself out because I know I got that coming to me, Jesus. And God is saying, no, you ain't gonna get yourself out of this. You are trying to find an answer within you when I have designed you to need something that's on the outside of you. You need breath to, br to live, but you can't breathe until you exhale. You have to let go of the very thing you need for life so that you can actually live. And so many times we, we think if we can just gain the whole world, we'll get it together. But Jesus said, if you gain your whole world, you lose your soul. Just like if you gain a breath, but you stop breathing, you've lost your life. Life is about receiving and trusting God for the next one. Give that one up and take another one in. It's all about a life of faith and believing that in him I'm living, in him I'm moving, in him I'm having my very being. That his strength truly can be made perfect in my weakness. Hallelujah. So he, he says here, and, and, and listen, you have to know that, that, that because of the structure of the curse, there are going to be many men that will think they're defined by how they eat bread, by their sweat, by their work. And there are many women that think they're defined by their relationship and their children and their marriage. Oh my goodness. That's Genesis 3 stuff. So you ask the average man, how are you doing? And the man's gonna talk about work and how busy he's been. And you ask the average woman how she's doing, she's gonna talk about home, marriage, life, the children. But ladies and gentlemen, neither one of those define you. Men, you are not defined by the money you make. You are not defined by the car you drive. You are not defined by the house you live in. You're not defined by the clothes you wear. You're not defined by the title you have on your job. Ladies, you are not defined by who loves you or who doesn't and what relationship you have or not. You are not defined by your children. You are defined by your God. In him you live, in him you move, in him you have your very being. If I as a man think that my life, the totality of my life is in my occupation, then I live for my work. How many men didn't make it in some? And so they want to find their identity in their children. Some of these parents cussing and cussing out umpires and going crazy over there on the bleachers at a baseball game. It's because they missed their moment. They're trying to relive it in the life of their child. Sit down and hush. Everybody can't win all the time. Oh, hang on, hush. That was a bad call. And guess what? There's going to be a lot more bad calls in life. But you need to teach your child to gracefully handle the good calls and the bad calls that they're not defined by a championship ring. They're defined by the character in which they walked off that field in, knowing that they gave their best. Everybody can't always win, but how do you respond to a loss? We find, my point is, we're finding our identity in so much of this I. But you cannot stand in front of an I am God and say I am. If you stand before an I am God in faith, you have to say he is. Brother Jefferson, would you come help me in just a minute, brother? I, need, I, I, I illustrated this at eight. I'm going to do it again. I need you to see this. I want the visual image. So Brother Jefferson is going to be a picture of God today. Okay? He's the I am God. I'm me. So if it's Exodus 3, he, he's God in the burning bush. I'm Moses. 
I can't stand before an I am God and say I am. I cannot stand in front of an I am God and make me the object. I am strong. I am wise. I am powerful. I am sufficient. I am whole. That is not true. How you might say that without an I am God, but how can you say that in the presence of an I am God? That's why David said, my soul, my soul, my soul shall make its boast in the Lord. I don't know what I got to do, Brother Jefferson. In other words, I'm not going to stand before God and glorify me. Oh, oh, Pastor James, you are so wise. He gives wisdom. Oh, Pastor James, you married such an amazing woman. His favor. Oh, Pastor James, the Lord has blessed you with such a, such a bountiful ministry. He is good. See, I'm not going to take no credit for anything in my life because I know it's an I am God that has made me to be who I am. So when he says I am, I say he is. And when you look at me and see something of God and you say you are, I say, no, he is. I feel like praising him. That's why I can't be in line at Walmart and you say glory and I not say hallelujah. And you not say praise Jesus and I say glory to God. I ain't gonna let no rock cry out in my place because I know it's because of the I am that I am what I am. I am only what I am because of who he is. I've seen me without him and it ain't this. The woman at the well before she met I am is afraid of folk. After she met I am, she went and won a whole city. Gideon, before he met the I am, said, I'm poor, I'm a farmer, I'm weak, we're small in number. After he met I am, he led the children of Israel, just a handful, to great victories. Why? He lost himself when he found himself in I am. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Brother Jeff. Man, you clean too, brother. <laughs> I double dog dare you to take every credit that somebody tries to put on your life and start just rolling that over on Jesus. Live to bring him glory. Live to bring him praise. Live to make his name big. Live to make him famous and see what God will do with you. Be no limit to what he can do. There's no, I remember the Lord telling me this many years ago. I'll never forget this. He said this. He, he, he gave me these words. He said, I can do anything in your life that you won't take the credit for. Got to let that. The Lord gave me that word. He said, I can do anything in your life that you won't take the credit for. Because there's one thing God won't share. He won't share his glory. Now, let me show you today's society and how Satan's lie is still infecting today's society right here in, in Isaiah 47, and we'll close here in a second. When you say I'm agnostic, what does it mean to be Gnostic? It means you don't believe in anything upward or outward. Gnosticism focuses on self. So if you're agnostic, you don't believe in a divine influence. You don't believe in God and his hand in anything, not creation, not man, not life, that there is no God to engage. That's agnostic. There is no God. I won't hold God in my knowledge. Gnosticism, by definition, means inward. So if you're caught up in Gnosticism, it's all about inward, 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 inward. The real me is in me. Oh, I found the real me, and I'm not a man. 
I've got to make myself look like what I found in me. No, 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 no. Your answer is not in you. Your answer is in him. See, our whole world right now is caught up with the inward stuff. And Gnosticism is not the only one that does that, even Buddhism. The, th- the, third, the third principle of Buddhism is to be perfectly self-enlightened. Enlightened, rather. It's the third principle of Buddhism, to be perfectly in- self-enlightened. I've got to find me. I remember years ago telling our worship team at the time, we can't be singing songs that are about self. Even if they're good songs and encouraging, not in corporate worship. I don't want to sing, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend. Well, I am a friend of God. Okay, good. Sing that in your car. But, but when I stand before God, I'm not going to say, I am anything. How am I going to say, I am in the presence of he is? And I made some folk mad. They love that song. I love the song. It says it's true that Abraham was called a friend of God. Nothing wrong with being a friend of God. That encourages you to listen to it. I'm talking about in a worship setting. Worship is consumed with who he is and what he has done. I got to get me out of the way. I believe what's wrong today with church and even preachers, and I'm one of them, is that we are focusing too much on self. Pulpits have become counseling sessions. Sermons have become self-help seminars. I don't need all of that. Jesus is the answer. His word is the answer to my life. I don't need to give you seven steps to a better life. Live for Jesus and find your life. I'm going to close. I really am because this is it right here. Watch this. Psalms 40. I mean, Isaiah 47. Here we go. Verse 10, thou hast trusted in thy wickedness, for thou hast said, none sees me. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. You know too much. You think you know. Romans 1 talks about this, this, this silliness of man when he thinks he's wise. Romans 1.22 says, when we profess ourselves to be wise, we become fools. Proverbs 15, 24 says the way of life is above. The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. See, if I'm wise, I'm looking for a source outside of me. I'm looking to God. What would I look like right here during worship? And and, and I'm, I'm in worship and, and, and I'm getting ready to preach the word. And, I'm, and let's just say hypothetically, I'm not saying this. Hope nobody pulls this clip out and lies on me because, you know, that folk would praise this world. But imagine if I did this and like, ooh, I, 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 I've studied for this day. I've preached for all my adult life for this day. I got this. 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 I know the word. I've been studying. I'm a student of the word. I preached before. I got this. I got this. I got this. Are you kidding No, 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 no. Lord, you got this. You got this. I can do all things through you who gives me strength. Lord, you be the hand in my glove. You fill me with your spirit. See the difference? I, I'm not, I ain't got time to be building up self. Well, you got to build yourself up. Build myself up in faith. Build myself up in the spirit of God. Build myself up in his promise. That's what I build myself up in. I ain't got nothing in me to build myself up with without him. But the world today is saying the exact opposite. And God says here in Isaiah 47, 10, he said, Thou wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. Watch this. And why, this verse is so powerful. Watch this. I could not end this series without this verse. It may be why there's this added part today just to get this out. Because this is powerful. Thou hast said in thy heart. Here we go. I am and none else beside me. Did you see that? God said there are people that have been so perverted in their earthly wisdom and knowledge that they say to themselves, I am, and there is none else beside me. I am my own God. I am my own way. I am my own identity. I am my own truth. I am my own good or evil. That's the lie that Satan gave in the beginning. And look how it's twisted our world today. No, that should not be the position of a believer. 
Mm -mm. No, my position is one of desperation. That's why the first beatitude in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What do you mean poor in spirit? I'm always begging. I'm always empty. I'm always needy before God. I'm never self-sufficient. I'm never where I need to be. I'm always desperate. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That word poor means beggar. I'm always begging of God. I'm always relying on God. I don't rely on God Tuesday, but what he did Monday. I need God Tuesday like I saw him Monday. I can't believe God that because he did it last, year that it's just going to be automatic. No, I got to call on this God. I am in desperation. I'm going to get through this thing today because of, 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 of him and I am desperate and I'm calling on him because my life is hid in him. That is a position that God wants us in. It's in your, it's your healthiest position. So instead of getting away for three days to go find yourself, how about get away for three days to go find Jesus? When I say find Jesus, find his will, find his word. Go into prayer and say, Lord, I need your will to be done in me. Your kingdom come. You take dominion over me, Lord. I, I, I'm, I'm a Jacob that needs to be Israel. I'm a Gideon that don't know my future. I'm a scared woman at a well that don't know. I'm actually an evangelist that'll win a city. You don't really know who you are until you come to him. There's a you that you might not even know that's hid in him. Glory to God. He'll turn a shepherd boy into a king. Job said it like this, and I'm almost done. In Job 16, 19, from the Amplified, he says, Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven, and he who vouches for me is on high. Ephesians 2, 10 says this, We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In other words, I'm his workmanship. He has a plan for my life. He has a purpose for my life. And I don't really find me until I find him. I want to pray with you this morning. Well, now it's afternoon. But I want to pray with you. And just encourage you in this moment to own so that you can give it up, to go ahead and own all this I stuff and then give it away. Own all the times you thought you could do it without him. Own, own, own all those things that you found your identity in that wasn't him. Because there is nothing in this world that is absolutely secure outside of our relationship with Jesus Christ. So I've got to find my identity in the only thing that cannot be shaken. I want to pray with you. But I want you to find, if it's there, this version of you that's in Isaiah 47.10 that says I am and none else is beside me. No, no, you're not. That's the, that's, that's the you the enemy wants you to see. Why not lose that life today and find the one that's hid in Christ? A life of purpose, a life of fulfillment, a life of that the true and living God who stands outside of time offers each one of us today. You ever lose your keys and after two hours you pray and then you find them? And you're mad that you didn't pray two hours ago? Why waste one more year of your life? Because there are more than keys at stake. There's a destiny, there's a purpose, there's a plan. Why let the enemy steal one more day of your joy? I wanna pray with you. I'm gonna pray for you and then I invite you to pray with me, okay? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that your word never returns void. And I acknowledge right now, Father, that your spirit speaks 
in ways that goes beyond anything any man could ever say. And your word says that by your spirit, our ears will hear, our eyes will see, and our heart will receive that which goes beyond human knowledge. So I ask right now that your spirit would speak to each one of us in an individual way so that we can take this word that was spoken to a corporate assembly and be able to apply it to our life in a personal, intimate way. And Father, I acknowledge that only your spirit can do that. Show us how to apply this word to our life today. Now with every head bowed and all eyes closed, is there something you need to renounce? Is there something you just need to let go of right now? Is there a lie that you've allowed the enemy to bite you with that you just need to release that right now and look to Jesus and say, I'm I'm getting rid of this lie of a self-made person and I'm gonna get rid of this lie that my identity is wrapped up in this, that, and the other. A woman that didn't want to talk to one man became an evangelist who won a city. That's what happens when we find ourselves in him. And you know what? Jesus didn't let her five husbands and her current situation stop her from being used to bring a whole city to him. Your history does not have to define your destiny. you just pray right now I mean where you at just ask him you know in your own heart Lord what's your will for me what's your plan for me I want to be who you called me to be I'm looking at myself as a poor farmer but you made me to be a man of valor who have you made me to be I invite you to pray with me Heavenly Father I've heard your word and I believe that you are the I am God. And I acknowledge today that fulfillment, a life of purpose, It's found outside of me. It's found in you. And I believe you sent your son to die for me that I could live for you. So I ask forgiveness of my sins and my pride. I renounce today the idea of being self-made. I want to be who you made me to be. Your workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So fill me with your spirit. Have your way in my life. Use me for your glory to advance your kingdom. And I thank you that nothing in this world, including my own failures, defines me. But I find my life in who you made me to be. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.